Aaron Cleary. How you doing, brother? Doing good. So we uh, so we hang out from time to time. This is uh, this is going to be a show on minimalism and boobies. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> if we if we had a show on that topic, I think we'd get a lot of views. But we're going to be talking about achieving minimalism theory and practice. You're the you're the resident uh, economist in you know the space, I suppose. Mm-hmm. You know, being the only guy that's worked in uh, uh, banking, I mm-hmm. worked on the other side on the debt side of the business. But um, minimalism, why is it important? Let's let's start with that question. Uh, the the number one is freedom. That's the number one thing. I, and how does that's it why facilitate I put- the freedom? Yeah, it's, you know, I don't know why everybody else is here on the planet, but I'm here to have fun and live my life as I want. Now, what is a mathematical economic reality is that you have to generate the money to support and maintain your life. Um, And that requires a job, that requires labor, which in addition to sleep takes up another third of your life. Uh, and I don't know about you, but I want to live the majority of my life being free. Basically, I want to get back to being four years old where I had no school. I had no responsibilities. Everything was bought and taken care of, but I'm an adult, so I have a driver's license and I can get a drink or something and a credit card. That's basically as far as my economic logic takes me. You want to be free. But most people, they they get seduced or they succumb to kind of like marketing and spending, they go into debt and ins- essentially enslave their one and finite life on this, but they enslave it to banks, to credit cards, to items, to materialism, uh, which basically ruins your life as far as I can think. And so, and I'm not, this is why I, I put it together is I really do think the subtitle is the key to success and happiness in life because it is, it's, it's, it's my, my opinion, but I, I'm pretty sure it's a fact. Mm. That if you are not slaving away for somebody else, if you have your finances together, then you're going to get to the point sooner rather than later where you're not working for anybody else. You get to do what you want with your life. And sure, we could say uh, retire early. Um, We could also say that, you know, well, could you really retire? You want to do something, you know, nobody can just retire and watch TV all day. Mm -hmm. But the point is to get to that point and not be these poor schmucks who are like, you know, subscribing to reverse mortgages at the age of 72 and they have to work until they're dead. So that's, that's why minimalism is so important is because that is the most direct route to getting to that early retirement, to having the maximum amount of your time doing what you want with it, not working for somebody else, not just trying to get by to, to survive, but having things in place. It could be uh, multiple streams of income where that's taken care of. And now you can actually go live as a free man. Surprisingly, a lot of very successful business icons are minimalists. Mm-hmm. There was a famous interview, I think, with Jeff Bezos. He was he was driving to work when they were doing this um, docu series on him, and they were driving with him in his fucking minivan, yeah. and like a Honda Odyssey. and And the interviewer was like, well, "Why are we going to your office in a Honda Odyssey? Why don't we have a driver and a Rolls Royce taking us there?" He's just <laughs> like, "I just don't care. It's minimalist, whatever." But mm-hmm. um. Yeah, I get. It. I mean, there's a lot of guys that like over overextend themselves with credit, and you know they try to signal off to the world how amazing their life is, but they're driving in a lease car, you know, renting a house, or they're living in their parents' basement, you know, as a grown ass adult, where their credit cards are maxed out, but they're walking around in shiny new tailored suits and all that sort of stuff. I did a video a couple of years ago on minimalism when I was driving by this neighborhood um, when I used to drive into the office on the regular. It's just big ass giant houses like the McMansions, mm-hmm. like you talk about in your um, book, Bachelor Pad Economics. Um, and I think you talk a lot about minimalism in that book, even though you don't explicitly use the term that often in it. Like, was is this something that's newer to you, or something that you've always? No, no, kind of it, described it, it, it's how it's how I survive. People are like, well, how do you get? You know, everyone makes fun of me. Oh, we can't all sleep in. Like, well, yeah, you could if you didn't spend that much money. So minimalism was forced on me. That's that's how I how I got there. So this wasn't like I studied it. I mean, I, I, I practice it out of necessity. Um, but this is what got me from being poor to being relatively well off. We could say upper middle income. And I wouldn't even say upper middle income. It's more time to me than it is how much money I make. Mm. Uh, but yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Is uh, you working in finance on, on the consumer side, also me working in finance on the lending side. Um, yeah, you're right. Uh, you, you could see it. And I saw it looking at people's tax returns and personal financial statements 
there, there are people that are enslaving themselves essentially to status and prestige and peacocking mm -hmm. for the guys out there predominantly to get the girls. Uh, but they can't keep that up because I've seen their, I've looked under the hood. I see, oh yeah, that's a lease car. That's a, a McMansion house. So it's all fake. It's all fake out there. I'd say 95% of the cars and the houses and all that you see is not real. It's all debt. Yeah, um, it is. But that's, that's the problem is trying to keep up that plastic lifestyle is not sustainable in the long run. You inevitably file for bankruptcy, wife divorces you, you got to sell the house. So that's, that's another you know, kind of warning, especially to the younger guys that might be tuning in is like, yeah, you, you can't afford a peacock. It's you, you, you cannot fake it. You, you have to like not care what other people think. You don't have to worry about the fancy clothes or bottle service or whatever. Mm. Uh, but going down that path to get presumably the girls, uh, that's, that's not going to work. Yeah. Um, yeah. The point that I was driving at when I made that video and I was driving through that neighborhood was all these McMansions were on probably about an acre of land, um, three, four car garages, 200 feet between the properties, lots of property taxes, probably about 12 to 15 grand a year in the area that I was driving through. And it's not even in Toronto. It's definitely in the suburban remote area, if I could put it that way. Um, with nothing around you, there's not a lot of amenities around you. And I was always, <clears throat> I was always fascinated by the guys that would like build up these giant massive big mansions living in them with like one or two people. Sometimes they have larger families, but they don't seem to be that big. And I did the same thing too. Like, I'll be honest, like I built a, a almost 5,500, 6,000 square foot wow. custom home. Um, bought it in 2007 or eight business was doing really well. You know, it was engaged, getting married. Um, you know, my fiance at the time had, um, you know, she was a strong, income earner. She had, uh, the big ambition for, you know, the 10 foot ceilings and the $15,000 right. chandeliers and the $10,000 curtains and all that kind of shit. And it's like, after a while, it's like, wow, I blew a lot of money on dumb shit. And there was things that I would have rather spent my time and energy and resources on. And I started to realize about 10, 12 years ago, after this entire process started, like, I like experiences way more than stuff. I don't know about you. Like, like you're a motorcyclist. I always see you hiking whenever you're doing your social posts and you're like, Hey, you know, how's work today? You assholes with a, you know, post like this sort of thing on your social feed. It's just me giving back love to the audience. That's all. Just... Yeah. Well, you're a very loving guy. You know, you're a very caring, loving guy. You know, you call yourself a asshole and you have an a asshole consulting company, but I, right. but I find you to be a uh, kind man. No. You know, yeah. The, uh, well, it, and I agree with you, uh, because it, it is more experiences, not to sound like a millennial, like, oh, I want to YOLO and live experiences. But but the truth is, and I've always, this has been, the, especially since college, my home has always just been the place I sleep and store some key things I need to get by. Um, life is out there. It could be your career, in my case, motorcycle riding, hiking and all that. And um, it is the experiences. I would also say it's people like, you know, you got kids and uh, some people might have a spouse or family or friends or whatever peer group. Um, but you, you're, you're sleeping in your house. Half the time you're in your house, you're asleep. You're not even conscious. Uh, and I think, you know, going out and having those experiences, is what really makes life good. Now, this doesn't mean you can't have a nice house, but uh, I, I told this to a couple of people, but you know how long it took me to pack uh, my house up and all the things I own when I sold my house to move into this inevitable apartment I'm in now. I'm assuming not much. Two hours. Okay. That was it. It all fit in my truck. That's, that's it. And then boom, I was gone. And that is, it's easy. It's, it's convenient for moving. Uh, but it's just, it just makes life a lot easier. It streamlines it. It makes things like moving is a pain in the ass. It's just a Royal pain in the ass. But then as you're saying, like with the chandeliers and the granite countertops, da, 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 it's like, okay, you got all this stuff, but how much are you going to enjoy it? Is this really what life is about? I don't know if you've ever seen American beauty, but, um, uh, where he's trying to make a pass at his wife and he's about to seduce her. And it looks like he's about to spill a little bit of beer on the couch. He's like, Oh, Lester, you're about to spill beer on the couch. He's like, so what? And that's, that's the problem. Everybody thinks it's the counts. It's the a chandelier. It's the granite counter. It's the car. It, it's, it's, it's like, no, it's like, that's your wife or that's your kid. Or maybe it's just you going out and doing what you want, driving that. He got that firebird in, in the movie as well. And so, uh, in part, another reason I want to do it is to kind of deprogram or at least introduce the concept that there's more to life than stuff. And, and it, it's other things, other people, other experiences, and not necessarily whether you have a, a McMansion out in a, a prestigious neighborhood or not. 
So why don't you have a cabin in the woods with like a wood stove and no electricity? Uh, I am I am getting that. I'm building my place in South Dakota, um, and it it would be uh, minimalistic. There is going to be a wood burning stove, uh, so I'm in the process of doing that. Um, so yeah, I, I'm living the way I I I, I, I practice what I preach. Uh, oh. But it's just it's in the middle of being built right now. But it's not it's not even that big of a house. It's only going to be like fifteen hundred square feet. But that's that's all I need. Right. Why in South Dakota? Is there like tax benefits? Is yeah, the... no state income taxes, beautiful motorcycle riding. Uh, the mountains, there's a little bit of a mountain range out there, but it's not so high. You get altitude sickness. Mm -hmm. Like if you go into Colorado and like anything above 12,000 feet, you're gasping for air. Uh, so I really like the air. Plus there's a lot of uh, geological stuff going on, like agates, garnets, fossils. So you could do some fossil hunting. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's the area I chose, but it's, it's not a going to be a fancy or big house, but it'll be more than adequate. And it'll be more or less bought and paid for. So you're talking about like a 180 shift in the way the entire direction of society moves when it comes to stuff, mm -hmm. right? I, I mean, everybody's all the marketing messages, everything that's in commercials, everything that you see in social media feeds, buy more crap, get unlimited financing, can't afford this thing over 24 months. That's okay. We'll finance it over 130 and you know, you can have a brand new vehicle at 0% financing. Um, you've, you've gone in a totally different direction. I mean, you buy used old motorcycles and used old cars and you kind of travel in a very frugal way. And, you know, like I see you driving a, I don't know what kind of truck it is, but it doesn't look like it's seen seen better days recently it looks like it's seen a lot of tougher days recently but i mean like you don't strike me as a guy that's hurting for cash but i mean yet you live as a minimalist sort of in your own lifestyle like is is it is it a lifestyle that you've chosen is it authoring books is it something in particular that allows you to live that way or yeah the internet was well, you know i mean that was a game changer i don't think we would have been able to do this 50 years ago without the internet so that allows freedom that we can do stuff like this you know i'm, I'm at an airbnb over in wisconsin uh but the the life i didn't choose this life i originally wanted to be an economist and a banker and i did that um but you know life has a curious way of pulling you in different ways and i ended up being a really good ballroom dance instructor for some reason i ended up being a really good author even though i flunked out of seventh grade english um, and, and you know, the, I mean, what was what? the shift for you when you were doing the work in banking where you're like, F this, this is stupid. I'm not doing this for the rest it, of my life. Like, was there a moment or something? Yes. Yes, there was. And it was the buildup. And I was writing a book predicting the housing bubble. And I was at this bank and this banker, just this dick. Um, he wasn't my boss. Like the line went across and he kept hounding me about this financial deadbeat that was always doing extend and pretend. And he, he wasn't cash flowing. His tax returns were, were bogus. Da, 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 da. And he's like, when's this going to get? I said, I can't approve this. I don't change the numbers unless you want me to be fraudulent and lie about the numbers. Like it's a math formula. I'm analyzing numbers. There's no opinion here. So he kept hounding me, hounding me. Well, then all of a sudden he comes in, he's all sheepish one day. He's like, are you working? I forget the names, the Johnson file. And I'm like, yeah, what about it? He's like, well, can you like, give it to me and hold or don't throw anything away? I'm like, oh, why is that? He says, well, the FBI is here and they want all of his files. <laughs> what were you doing? And, mortgage underwriting? No, I was doing a commercial lending. Oh, okay. And so you get all these wannabe dude bros who, you know, like you said, it's all flashing cash, but they're guys our age, maybe even a little bit older, who are businessmen. And all they were doing was taking money out of uh the real estate portfolio you know like if 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 the property they'd reassess their property value have it appraised and if they could get 50 grand out of it they take it out and they go buy a boat and mm -hmm. and uh, oh look at us we're really cool that kind of thing so that was that was the moment where i real and then i the math and everything all my research was showing that the stock or the housing market was going to collapse and when it did i realized that i don't care how much gray hair these guys had i don't care what their mbas were they were all lying sacks of filth Mm -hmm. And it was all a game. So I, I was like, that's it. I'm, I'm done. Ended up working security, uh, continued ballroom dancing. But then that was when my first book came out. And that kind of sent me down the path we're on today. So what was the breakout book for you? Was it Bachelor Pad? No, it was, um, well, the breakout book I think would be worthless. That was the one that got, got me most nori uh, notoriety. Um, and that came after Behind the Housing Crash. But that was the one that kind of went viral through, mm -hmm. um, Glenn Reynolds and Dr. Helen Smith's uh, PJ Media. So they're kind of instrumental in that. Okay. So I got this uh, 
Clary School of Economic Philosophy here mm -hmm. on my other screen here. Um, it opens with you're going to die. <laughs> yes, you're going to die. <laughs> you have a choice. You can continue running the rat race forever in debt, living paycheck to paycheck, enslaved to your employer and increasingly estranged from your family, or you can become a minimalist. Would you say that I'm a minimalist? I'm curious your opinion uh, about see, you know, I, It you know depends. I, I would say no because of, of the car, but this is an interesting philosophy because you can afford it. Um, like that's, and every guy needs a hobby. Every guy needs a vice. You can't just be living in a hut and not having some kind of uh, a hobby. Uh, if people are like borrowing money and, and trying to, but you're not trying to put up the facade. We, and we talked about your fancy cars and everything before that's, that's your passion. You enjoy it. You actually go out and drive it. You're not doing it to impress anybody. You just like having fancy cars. But if I can buy a car that costs four times as much and I settle on something that costs less but still delivers the experience that I'm looking for, mm -hmm. I feel like that makes me a minimalist. Can I can I get a hoorah or something you, like that? Yeah, you, you get a hoorah, yeah. But I, it, it, I would say you should rent, you see? Like go rent it for a week and then and then get another car. Well, but speaking no, of I, renting, talk, talk about the picture of you in front of that Ferrari on the uh, thumbnail. <laughs> Because, That's, you know, I had to create the event. I'm like, Aaron wants to talk about minimal. I'm like, Aaron Cleary, at Google Images. And it's like in the top row, it's like there's a picture of you in front of a Ferrari in the tux. I'm like, That's the one that we're going to use. There, yes, yes. Uh, Jack Napier, but how are you a minimalist? It's like, okay, one, I didn't own the Ferrari. I rented, rented it. It, it, was, yeah. it, was, it was my girlfriend's 40th birthday. She always wanted to drive a Ferrari. And then I rented it. I think we rented it for three days. And what was funny is because I gave a buddy of mine my truck, the old one that you you are surprised still drives around. So, I lent it to a buddy and we took the Ferrari. And so I'm like, you still have to run errands. So I'm like delivering pizzas. Like I put pizza in the Ferrari and I'm getting groceries in the Ferrari. I'm like, this is kind of weird. Uh, but that was that was a short-term rental. But I got to experience, like experience it. Yeah. And and now I know I never want to drive a Ferrari ever again because they're loud and clunky. It's very didn't like it, eh? No, nope, very loud. Very you think it's always breaking down. It's like, nah, that's just the engine doing its thing. So no, it's it, yeah, it's loud. It makes a lot of uh noises very loud noises you know as we like mm -hmm. to say um let me grab these uh, super chats here there's one that popped in it says a competent man says you run into people buying things like a boat and a caddy with a full, first pull of money out of a property i recall one person named first Straw, <laughs> a boat named first Straw. <laughs> yeah um i don't know what what do they say about boats you know like people uh it's like a hole in the water you throw money into no. You know the three F rule? Have you ran into that in your financing world? Yeah, if it flies, if it floats, floats or, or if fornicates. It acts, yeah, if it it's fornicates, fun. you rent you it. You rent it. Yes. Yeah. You do not buy. No. Yeah. yeah. But I've seen many people, you know, they gotta get the boat and they gotta get the car. Planes are even worse. Oh my gosh, you're going to a whole new world of maintenance costs, especially with FAA compliance. But yeah, just anybody listening, do not ever buy a boat, do not ever buy a plane. You rent those things and then you hand that off to the other person i have a friend that owns two planes he got stuck with the second one because he hasn't been able to sell it yet but you know with the hangar space and all the maintenance costs oh, yeah but yeah. it costs a bit i mean we flew it down to philadelphia a couple of years ago just for a guy's weekend and it was like you know the fuel uh it's very convenient you know from the perspective of like landing and, and taking off and not dealing with customs it's super convenient from that perspective but it's also quite a bit more pricey than flying commercial oh yeah but um, yeah, it was fun. Um, let me throw up on the screen over here the uh, the course curriculum so we can kind of run through it. Um, let me see here. Achieving minimalism. Share. Does that go up? There we go. There it is. So this is your course that you've put together. And uh, gentlemen, you're going to die, according <laughs> to the captain. Uh, but you can increase your uh, life satisfaction by becoming a minimalist. Can you explain the course and what's all in it? And I mean, there's five hours here. You sent me these links uh, not too long ago. I haven't chance to look at it all, but there's, but there's looks like close to five hours worth of material. Like what are you, what are you putting out here? What's this all about? Well, the, it's broken down into two things, a, a theory and a practicum. And uh, the goal of that is we could talk, you know, I could, I could give you the practicum is do X, Y, Z of which, uh, there's a lot of material out there already, like how to be a minimalist. So it's instructional. Um, there's some things that you will not find in another book or Henry David Thoreau, things I've learned throughout uh, uh, living my life. But before you, I just say do X, Y, and Z, you have mm -hmm. to understand why. And so there's half of it, if not more than half of it, 
is the theory of, of minimalism and its counterpart, materialism. Why are humans compelled to spend more than they make? Why are humans compelled to consume more than they need? And the psychology there is the same thing as overeating, addiction, trying to quit smoking, trying to quit drinking, things like that. As humans, you need to consume because uh, that's what keeps you alive. You need to consume air, resources, things like that. So con you are biologically programmed, 2 million years of human evolution to consume. Uh, but we get to the point now where, especially with finance, you can consume more than you can produce, which has the financial consequences. So that first part delves into basically the psychological nature of materialism and minimalism so you understand it and how you can psychologically reprogram and rewire yourself to, not, to, to ignore that. You know, I want to eat more food. No, you put it down. Oh, I want to have a cigarette. No, you don't. Oh, I want to get this car. No, you don't need it. And what I like to I liken it to then is I also introduce kind of a, a substitute. Like if you're a heroin addict, you got to take, I think it's methadone or maybe it's Oxycontin. Um, so I just don't say, oh, go do this. I say, here's the psychological reasons this is happening. And here is a substitute for consumption that when you feel the need to consume, you run the psychological program or the subroutine instead. And that should negate your desire to spend more. Then the practicum is, you know, instructional. Um, I talk about things that nothing that you wouldn't know, like you have a budget, uh, you could do a cash envelope system, which is, I think what David Ramsey recommends. I uh, give a couple tricks of the trade that I use. Like you never pay, uh, you only pay cash for cars. You get um, uh, uh, what they call uh, not cashed out, where the insurance company cash for under value with life insurance. No, no, it's uh, where a car because cars are the third largest thing you're going to buy behind a house in your education. Um, where they're insuranced out, like the insurance company totals them out. They're totaled out, but there are. Uh, mechanics out there that will repair these cars and make them roadworthy again. So you get okay. a very low mileage car, but it's just damaged or stuff like that. Um, and then other things like renting a Ferrari. You want it? You want to live the dude bro lifestyle? Okay. Well, why don't you get a condo downtown for one month in the flashy district? Get your get your Ferrari rental, whatever it is. See if you like it, and then you'll find out you probably don't. And you're like, oh, you never worry about that again. There's never that curiosity. You've scratched that itch. So that's where the, the practicum is. It's some, some good uh, tricks of the trade to implement minimalism in your life. Um, talk about getting rid of your stuff. You have a, you have a lesson in there on that. I, I've, I, I've made a concerted effort over the last few years anyway to just get rid of shit that I don't need. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I often find myself when I'm at a store picking something up, maybe putting it in the buggy or thinking about buying it. It's like, ah, do I don't really need this. And I just kind of drop it sort of thing. And I put it back on a shelf just so I don't have to deal with putting it in a landfill later on in my life. Um, yeah. Talk about getting, getting rid of stuff a little bit. Uh, it's matters. the number I I'd say that's very key and critical because as I said before, the number one thing is not cars or, or education, it's housing. And if you look at most people's lodging, most of it goes to house stuff. Uh, housing, is, whether you're renting or buying, it's based on the number of square feet. That's number one determinant. And the more stuff you have, the more surface area, cubic area, actually, cubic volume you need to store. We get to the point we even have people where you store your stuff. The stuff you don't use for years, which proves you don't need it, is stored somewhere else that you're renting. Mm -hmm. And so if you can get rid of your stuff, you can live in a, a much smaller apartment. I have not lived in anything more than, uh, since I left uh, my parents' home when I was 18 years old. I did mm -hmm. have a, a sizable two-bedroom apartment in Wyoming, but that's because that was the cheapest thing. But in not, you know, especially gals, they love to have their furniture, their matching set furniture. It's like, how do you have matching furniture? I've got all my furniture from Goodwill and hand me down. Like, here's my couch. There's the coffee table that everything goes on. Here's my desk. And that's my, that's my bed. That's all I've ever had. And that's all anyone ever needs. Let me ask so, you a question. How many, you know, how many pillows does your girlfriend have on her bed? Two. Just two. Just two. I got a great gal. She, that's, that's pretty impressive because the the smallest number of pillows I've ever seen on a chick's bed is like four or five. Like my girl's got like four or five on hers. And even that I'm like, if you ever show up with like, if I ever come here and there's eight pillows on this bed, I'm like, we're done. I'm like <laughs> people that have eight, 12 pillows on their bed, they got serious problems in that life. Mm -hmm. Anyways. Well, there's, there's <laughs> other, other signs, you know, like 
could they collect do you remember beanie babies yeah junk oh god you know that that kind of stuff or they collect trinkets or whatever else like that if you just it, it, there's there's ways to trick yourself to be a minimalist and with the stuff it's basically you get the smallest place you possibly can mm. like a studio apartment and then that's going to force you to throw things away mm. uh, another thing that people have to do and <clears throat> most people don't do this is go through all your stuff like, and this is, you think you kick it down. It's like, I don't know, dental work or an oil change. Like, oh, I could do that later. I don't really have to. It's like, no, do it now because this directly affects the number one expense on your personal budget. And that is your lodging. So if you go through it and like, I don't need these clothes. I don't need these files. Like people save their college papers, throw that stuff in the shred bin. Mm -hmm. Okay. Your college degree was likely worthless anyway. Mm -hmm. um, get rid of books. I don't know why people have books. You got everything digitally. And unless you're going to read the book again, get rid of your books. Um, <clears throat> anything that takes up volume, you just, you just get rid of it. And you go through and you purge everything. Like you can have another rule. Like if I haven't used it in two years, it's out. Maybe you have a memento box. I have a box about yay big that's just full of mementos, and that's about it. Um, and if you do that, all of a sudden, yeah, you're packing all your stuff into the back of a truck. You can move in two hours. And oh, by the way, now you need a place that's a third the size and a third the cost of an apartment or a house that you would normally buy. And so it's it's really just taking the time to go through your, your stuff, throwing things away, getting over the sentimental attachment you have of it, uh, and, and then just like, oh, wow, then you're, you're freer. There's a psychological benefit where it's like, oh, I've cleansed the house. I, you know, you're, you're, it's just a, a tighter operation. Um, mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden the money really starts racking up when you can afford to live in a, a little studio apartment or a one-bedroom apartment. Um. Uh, two things. So competent man just clarified the salvage title for vehicles. Salvage I title. totally agree. I bought a salvage title E46 M3 around 2010 and I probably paid like 10 grand under market value. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's really interesting because the salvage title in certain states, they get salvage titles for some really dumb reasons. So car was stolen. It was in a shipping container uh, to go over to Africa. And um, I guess they raided it and they found all these stolen cars. So there was no flood damage. There was no um, hurricane damage. There's no damage to the vehicle whatsoever, but they wrote it off as a salvage title because uh, it was a theft recovery. And I think yeah. that was in a state in New, New Jersey. So in certain states, you can get salvage title vehicle that don't even have any kind of accident damage whatsoever. The title salvage, which means it'll be harder for you to sell later. But if you're going to like buy it and keep it, you can get a lot of value out of a car that's a salvage title for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I had a salvaged uh, Kia Rio 2008 and... Uh, Let's not talk about that. That's a loser car. <laughs> Come on, it's a great car. It's a great car. I'm kidding. I'm Standard kidding. I'm kidding. Transmission <laughs> had the actual roll the windows up. Everything was manual. Uh, I think I spent like thirty five hundred bucks on it. Had fifty thousand. I put a hundred thirty thousand miles on that thing before you never you got your money out of it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So if you, that's another thing is like you get a cheap car and you ride it into the ground. You know, yeah. do your basic repair and maintenance. But you know, you get a hundred thousand miles out of a three or four thousand dollar car. That's awesome, man. You're, you're, you're saving yourself at least 20, 30 grand uh, in just owning that one car. Yeah. Uh, to, to kind of flip over to the other side of the perspective, I'm, I'm in a McLaren group and there was a guy that was doing the calculation on the depreciation per kilometer driven on a McLaren Senna. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember what it was. It was, it was either 249 or 207, like over $250 per kilometer driven is what the depreciation value is on the damn thing. It's crazy, man. Um, I want you to talk about drawbacks of minimalism in one second. Let me grab the super chat. Rob says 1099 are here. Any data in your research on minimalism being tied to introvert, extrovert, and would eliminating the quality or sorry, quantity of people be a minimalist trait as well? I'd say yes to getting rid of the quantity of people in your life. You don't need 50 people in your life. But anyway, so Right. Yeah. No, I, I, I haven't seen any research or studies, but usually your minimalists are a little bit more cerebral. Like Elon Musk, you're talking about celebrities who are, are rich people, businessmen who uh, are minimalists. Elon Musk just became minimalist. He got rid of the house. I guess he lives in a one bedroom apartment. And I think you'll get to that point where you're like, what is really important to me? I'd rather have a conversation with Rich Cooper about philosophy and minimalism. I'd rather hang out with my buddy Elkins having a cigar. Uh, I don't need this dude bro party lifestyle uh, or, or, or the fancy flash in a cash. So it, it is attractive to more of an introvert or at least a, a self, uh, someone who has a, 
self-inspection or they, they, they look into themselves and ask what's really important in life. So it, it would be attractive. It would attract uh, kind of maybe the introverts, but certainly the cerebral types. Mm. Um, and then as in terms of the quali quantity of people, absolutely. Um, well, you know this, that we, I did the seminar on it. The number one expenditure men have in life in terms of their time, money, and resources is the pursuit of women. Mm -hmm. um, if you, instead of trying to be popular and going out with a thousand girls, da, 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 instead just like, nope, I'm only going to have some key people in my life and they're good quality people. Um, you're going to have higher standard of living, higher enjoyment, better happiness, better psychological health, but you're not going to waste your time. You're not going to waste your time trying to be in the popular guy club. You're mm -hmm. not going to waste your time dating uh, nines and tens who are flighty and flaky and, and all have to seem bipolar disorder. Mm -hmm. You'll probably avoid uh, getting divorced or having a low quality spouse in your life. Um, yeah. And, and then even with your kids, if you bring your kids up right, quality kids, you're not going to be wasting time and resources and stress sending them to the psychology department or the psychologist or getting them their antidepressants. So yeah, it's, it's very key to go after quality people, not quantity because quantity people will suck your resources up both financially and time wise. Um, let's talk about two more things before we wrap up. So guys, by the way, the, uh, link, if you want to buy the course from the Cleary school of economic philosophy on minimalism is pinned in the top comment. I'll drop it in the chat in a second. Um, but talk about, Two, uh, two more things before we wrap off. The drawbacks of minimalism, and then let's tie it into the sexual marketplace and get your opinion on how do you find a minimalist chick? How do you get the girl <laughs> that's a minimalist? Rich, I want to hear you what find your, out, if you, your opinion you got on the that answer, is. you should make a billion dollar book because I don't, I don't know how you find a minimalist chick. Um, the drawbacks uh, basically is, is one of statistics, and I wrote about this in Curse of the High IQ, but it's the same thing. There are so few people who are actually minimalists that you're going to become part of a of a very I wouldn't say obscure but a rare group of people. Uh, most people are plugged into the matrix. Most people have to work. Most people have debt, and so you're going to ostracize yourself a little bit, not only financially but psychologically and philosophically as well. Uh, financially, most people will not have the money or time to do this. That's, that's probably one of my major complaints is when I'm out west or I'm hiking around. By nobody has the time or the money to do it. People are young. They might be in shape, uh, but, oh, I got to work. Oh, I got and, Well, the reason you have to work is because you married your wife who has a history degree, and now you're bailing her out. Or you had to get this big house in the suburbs, uh, and you're anchored to that. So um, you're going to be you – know, and you probably run into these guys too. I, I guarantee even though they, you know, the McLaren groups, those guys have uh, expensive tastes in cars, they probably – have their financial act together in other ways, which also makes them a rarer breed. So it's rare to find uh, people who have the time and the money that minimalists do. Mm -hmm. The other thing is it's very hard to find people who have this philosophy because for the most part, the herd is successfully brainwashed into consumption and materialism. Uh, like, oh, I need to have these dreads or not these threads. I need to have Cavarici jeans or pants if you remember that back in your day. Um, I need to have this fancy car. Wifey Poo needs to have her whatever, uh, you know, SUV so she can go to the nail salon. Um, <clears throat> those people are not going to be your intellectual equals. And they define success as things or even bragging. I got a guy who lives in a very, like the richest part of Denver. I won't say where. And he lives in one of these developments. Well, he paid off his house. He's the only real rich guy in that neighborhood because what he did is he he was bored. He just looked up all the mortgages on all the different – not one. Not one rich. Not like him and another guy. He's the only guy who didn't take out a second mortgage and take equity out. Mm. So everyone is putting on a show. Everyone's trying to keep up with the Joneses. It's Fair. basically a continuation of middle school and high school where it's trying to be popular. Uh, you are not going to find your intellectual equals out there in, in the masses. So it's somewhat lonely. Um, it's great because you get to meet people on the internet. We can have these conversations. You can, uh, there's a uh, minimalist podcast, there's minimalist uh, sites. Um, and there's just good philosophers and you, you can find that intellectual stimulation online, but in the real world in meat space, it's very rare to find people that are going to be true minimalists and have the level of freedom that you do. So it, it's a social ostracization. There's a little bit of loneliness as well. Um, 
but it, it's still worth it in the end, I'd say, because you're 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 so much more free and you still can go hang out with people, you know, when they're available. Um so talk about minimalist uh women. How does well they how look does like a man horses. identify a minimalist woman? Well, they look like horses, but they have a horn coming out of them, and they're called unicorns, and they mm -hmm. don't exist. Um, <clears throat> no, it's hard. You have to train uh, your woman to be a minimalist? Yeah, yeah. Uh, my gal is an accountant, so she's good with numbers, but even I'm like, you're getting rid of- Accountants are of usually pretty tight with stuff, though. Yes, but- I've known. Yeah, and and for the most part, they, they at least know the finances. They understand debts and liabilities, so they academically understand it, but- I can't emphasize this enough. There is a huge psychological component to consume more. So even the, the gal that I was dating, um, she had a luxury vehicle that would break down all the time. And I think <clears throat> the fourth time she's like, can you take it to the dealership? I said, no, you're getting rid of this thing. Uh, it's costing you so much in maintenance, and everything like that. Um, so I, I would say you have to train this. That's then this goes back to our classic debate. You know, are women trainable? I think you're going to have to force women to say, if you're with me, you know, this is almost more important than religion. I'd say is we are having our financial act together. We are a no debt household. We pay cash for cars. Our goals is retirement. You better be throwing money into a, a 401k or an RRSP for uh, the Canadians. Um, I've never seen a gal have her financial act together to the point that I was satisfied with it, where I didn't have to say, Hey, we're, we're going to be on the same. We're going to make some changes here. So you're going to have to have a serious talk with the women. You're going to have to hold firm, say, no, I don't like women with debt. Um, it, and it's especially hard now because every girl now goes to college and takes on an inordinate amount of debt. So do men, uh, but women 80% of the time major in worthless crap. And so it's just, uh, it's really hard, especially when you're younger, to find a gal who's frugal, who has a financial act together, who throws money into a retirement account and things like that. Um, they're out there, uh, but it's it's really rare. It's really rare. And so, you know, how do you find them? I mean, you can ask them what the credit score is, but they'll tell you like, oh, I'm an engineering major and I have 20,000 of debt left over, but I got this job making eight grand a year. And oh, I like this one gal I dated, she had her, she already owned a, a condo uh, at the age of 27 or 28. Uh, and she, she was good with her money, but it's, it's the exception, not the rule. You just, you're just going to have to hope you find a gal and then your, your real chances of finding a, a minimalist woman is to convert her to minimalism uh, mm. and insist on it before you before you commit to her. I think the pillow test is a good test. If you see 18 <laughs> pillows on her bed, you're going to have a hard time converting her. I mean, my girl's got two more pillows than Aaron, so she's not quite as much of a minimalist. But I think at the same time, I mean, if you start like chirping questions like, you know, how long you had this car? What are your payments on it? You know, you're not asking if there's car payments or she's paid off. I mean, you know, she can volunteer the information that way. And you can learn a little bit more about their spending habits, but um, yeah, you should identify somebody that that um, you know has their financial act together. You don't want to be bailing chicks out. I mean, there's a lot of guys that will swoop in there and they'll bail out women, they'll bail out her kids from prior relationships, buy them cars, pay for the university, and crap like mm -hmm. that. You know, you know, you have to be smart about that. Um, again, Aaron's course, it's pinned in the top comment. I dropped it in the chat. One more question for you. Um, Okay, so let me just back up a little bit. Last Saturday on Rule Zero, because you were on that for a little bit, Myron said somewhere in the broadcast, I don't know if you were on at the time, but he's but he's certain and firm that in Miami, you know, specifically, you need to make be making at least a hundred thousand dollars a year if you want to do well in life and do well with women. That's mm -hmm. his perspective. Um, I want to hear from you as a minimalist, the resident economist. What do you think the minimum is that a guy needs to make to live a life of freedom, but as a minimalist, is it 40,000, 60,000? And where should guys be looking at living to take advantage of that? Bare minimum is 20 grand. Uh, I think in one that, of my books, that's right at the bottom. That's that is, but now okay. that is bare, bare bones. Like you're walking to work, you work from home. There's some other things that got to be in play there. I'm pretty sure I had it down to 17,000, but the book is about five to six years old. So there's been some inflation, but 20 grand. Mm -hmm. You could do other things like you can live cheaply. You know, you live in a, a foreign country. You don't live in the, the main centers. Um, this is also increasingly possible in the United States where you go out to the middle of nowhere, Wisconsin, and you rent the little hut above the, above the bar or whatever. So, and I've known guys who like, there's minimalist communes where guys will go in 
on a four bedroom apartment and they each have their own room, mm -hmm. um, you know, and they're biking to work. And so it is possible. I'd say 20 grand is the absolute bottom. I used to do that in my twenties. I used to, um, rent houses and, you know, split the rent with three other guys, like a four bedroom. We split it with three other guys. Even the first house that I bought, I basically stocked every room with roommates and had them paying my mortgage. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I'm not as extravagant as you think I am, Cappy. Well, I, I, I wasn't thinking you and, and George Clooney were going yachting anytime soon either. But uh, yeah, it's it. So I'd say twenty thousand is on the cheap. More modernly, uh, where I where I was okay, and you actually had enough money to start scoring away money for retirement. Between thirty to forty thousand, I'd say maybe thirty five to forty five thousand, uh, depending on where you live. And that's that. You know, and I'm not starving. Obviously, I got three square meals a day. My cars are all bought and paid for, but the real key thing, and this is <clears throat> more importantly for, for men and women, but I'm going to say men, because everyone is concerned about how much you make. No one is concerned about how much you save. And what's really important is the amount of money you save, which is called wealth. What is your net worth? Mm. And so if you're squirreling away, paying off your debts, getting equity in your home, over time, I almost guarantee you, because I've, I've seen plenty of tax returns where the guy makes 170, 180,000, but he spent 190, 200,000. Yeah, show for it. And he got nothing to show for it. Right. And so the guy who, you know, the, the tortoise in the hair classic story, the tortoise who squirrels away 10% of his income and throws it into an average returning mutual fund, all of a sudden at the age of 35, 40, he's sitting on a quarter million dollars in liquid assets and no debt. Meanwhile, the guy who's flashing the cash and the boats and, and boats in the hose, uh, he, he doesn't have anything to show for it, but as it pertains to women, I've, I've said this before, women, most of them do not know the difference between debt or equity spending. Most women are woefully ignorant of their finances, let alone their man's finances. So when this was very common in banking where the guy shipped, didn't come in his house of cards folded, <clears throat> the woman didn't realize that they were never millionaires and also in the house is repossessed. And they're evicted. And then, of course, she files for divorce and she's shocked at all that. Mm -hmm. um, so it really is kind of a, a game like, yeah, like if you go with hanging out with Myron, there's a lot of peacocking going on there. There's a lot of guys flashing the cash they don't have. Um, whereas, and, and it's true, the women are going to go for that because they see, ooh, shiny objects, shiny colors, nice That's feathers. the demographics of the sexual marketplace for the most part there too. Yeah, yeah, it is. Well, and even Myron, he just great, some great insights that Myron has where he's like, uh, you know, if it's a good looking gal, she's sponsored. Like it's almost a guarantee. She has a guy who's, who's a sugar daddy. Yeah, she's so on the, com somewhere. the competition is fierce, but you're not competing for women. You're competing to have an early retirement and an easy life. Uh, and, and that's why I think you got to separate the goals is you are in this to be liberated from an employer as quickly and as soon as possible. And hopefully there's a gal that it might be along the way there that shares that same philosophy. But in the end, especially when you turn out to be guys our age, um, you really start to separate the wheat from the shaft because now you got, you got assets, you got wealth built up. And so the long game, I think running that marathon, that's what you should be aiming for. And I'm not saying don't buy a nice shirt or try to impress a girl here or there, but uh, my experience has been that's a money losing proposition. It's just better to squirrel away your money and be kind of the silent millionaire next door that no one knows about. Yeah. I like those guys. Um, okay. So let's wrap up, talk about your course, uh, plug it real quick before we go, who should be taking a look at maybe buying this and enrolling in the five hours of lessons and uh, who should maybe not look at it. Anybody who's familiar with my work, and have their financial act together, like veteran readers of my, you don't need it. Um, this is for new people. Uh, that's why I'm having different people in different audiences. So if you're new to finance or you just have trouble spending more than you make, if you have that problem, this class is for you. It is pricey because I need it to sting so that you pay the F attention so that you are vested in this. And it is actually one of the higher return on investment classes out, out there because if I can get you to spend less than you make and actually start saving for retirement, then you're, I just saved your financial life. This has nothing uh, to do either with, if you could retire early, you get ahead of the game, totally worth the investment in the cost. Uh, but it's for, I'd say younger guys, younger gals who don't know anything, like you, you want to clutter your home. You, you're, you you're, you're got increasing credit card balances. You spend more than you make and you really would like to get rid of that. Take this course. Also for those of you who are a little bit more philosophically minded and, um, you're, you have angst 
always trying to work a lot. This gets into more of the management of time. Uh, we, I talk about managing money, which is a resource and usually what people focus on. But minimalism is also about your time. If you are frantic, you're not chilled out, you're not taking time, you're not enjoying life, you're a workaholic, which pot calling the kettle black, you know, just do what I say, not as I do. Uh, this would also be a good philosophy to take to, to achieve the Zen and to learn to manage your time better so that you're living life instead of working to live life. And so that, that would be the second group of people that, that might want to be considered taking this class. All right. So link below, if you guys want to grab it, uh, one last super chat here from Judd says thumbnail of Cappy in a tux in front of a luxury car. No way I call Photoshop. In all seriousness, though, uh, thoughts on minimalism factoring in time management, i.e. my car treadmill and king size bed. Can you make uh, sense of that? Thoughts no, on not minimalism really. Factoring, in time management. factoring time. Man well, money is time. And that's, I talk a whole lot about time um, because it doesn't matter if you have all the money in the world. If you have no free time, it's moot. Ask uh, Steve Jobs. Um, but I, I guess like if he's just got a car, a treadmill and a king size bed and that's what he's living, I guess that's good that's that's pretty solid i i will say this before we go you know i i spent 20 25 years in the uh debt relief industry call it debt consolidation bankruptcy debt settlement whatever the hell you want to call it and the common theme is every single person that ended up in a scenario where they had 20 30 40 thousand dollars worth of credit card debt that they could not got get rid of is just because they couldn't do basic math they couldn't do you know my income is three thousand i need to spend two thousand squirrel away the thousand have a rainy day fund 12 months later you got you know 12 grand um you know just basic money management skills and becoming a minimalist i'll co-sign exactly what we're looking at here if you're struggling with it take a look at cleary's course uh, hang on, we got two more supers here before we got to go. Comet Man says, there's a story of the year Chrysler went bankrupt, 2009, where VP couldn't pay his mortgage because he didn't get his bonus <laughs> for that year. True story. I'll tell you I'll tell you a story, Rich. Was when I was working security, there was a president and CEO of a very large multi-billion dollar company, and they built their new house, and they were going to have a big party and celebrate with the neighbors. And so also these trucks come in, and they're putting furniture in. I'm like, okay, well... I guess, you know, they got to get furniture. And then I was doing the overnight shift. And then sure yeah. enough, these trucks came in the next day. They started to move the furniture out. I'm like going up like, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. What are you doing with the furniture? And like, and the, and the guy came out and he's like, oh, no, we just rented the furniture. <laughs> That's how fake that family was. They had to rent the bleeping furniture, even though this guy made more than adequate money. And it's just, yeah, the, the amount of fake wealth out there is appalling. Uh, Frostly, Frost, Frostatine, Frostaline, I don't know. Uh, 29 year old cloud engineer from Denver, never used credit loans in my life. Everything I own fits my truck, living rent free with my ex, but still banging. Her parents <laughs> are rich as why am I, am I a minimalist? What is your assessment here? Captain? Well, yeah, if he's living rent free, living uh, rent free and still no banging debt. and still banging. Yeah. Okay. That's like a song living rent free and still banging. That's how I make a good country song. I think. Uh, I, I don't know. I was thinking that 50 cent might put that one out. Come on, 50. Uh, yeah, he is a minimalist. Yeah. And I'm very proud for him. I'm applauding the fact he's still banging his ex. That's uh that's an accomplishment there. Uh, Judd says, I own a treadmill, so no gym, gym membership. That's oh, what yeah. Yeah. No, that's good. Yeah. If you get your treadmill in there. Or just get rid of the treadmill and just walk. Just, just hike like the captain does. Yeah. All right, guys. I want to thank you for watching. Smash the like button. Leave a comment below. When does the course close? Because I know it's an open close period. Closes on the 30th, so you have up until 11.59 p.m. on the 30th to sign in, uh, Central Standard Time. Three days. If you want that course, grab it now. It'll be uh, locked down after that. All right, guys, uh, thanks for watching. Aaron, appreciate you, brother. Thanks for having me on.